So you think about buying a house in Sacramento and you're a first time home buyer. Tonight we break down the home buyer, the first time home buyer. Um, and I'm with Aaron and we're not live, but we figured this is a video that you guys probably been wanting us to do for a while. So we're talking about first time home buyer. What do you think about that? You know, the first time home buyer, it's, it's like that's uh, the elusive creature out in the market trying to make their way, you know, in the wild. And there's a lot of, of pitfalls, a lot of misinformation, a lot of fears that kind of exist that, that really shouldn't. Um, so hopefully we can kind of, you know, pull the curtain back tonight, give the audience, uh, you know, some of the information that they've been looking for. And, you know, you can walk away a more educated, you know, potential home buyer. Let's get going. Okay, so first let's get into it right now. With interest rates being what they are, budgeting is a little hard because you don't mm -hmm. know what your payments are looking like. So what do you recommend to people? Well, before you go talk to a loan officer, before you talk to a realtor, before you go talk to anybody, talk to yourself. Not in a crazy way, of course, but uh, create a budget. You know how much money you make. You know how much your family or you by yourself or whatever, you know how much you spend on groceries and school and gas and all those things. So you should have a pretty good idea of what you can afford, right? You, you may not know what you actually qualify for as far as getting a home loan, but you should know if you can afford three grand a month, four grand a month, five grand a month, whatever the case is. But before you go even seek out any professional advice, look within, figure out exactly in-house, what can I actually afford? Then after you've established your budget, that's when you get the pros involved. And, you know, we can dive into that next. Or do you have, uh, you know, more questions about, about the budget? Well, okay. Here's the thing for me. Like when I was shopping for a house, mm -hmm. one of the things for me was the thing is like, look, talked with the wife and everything too. And we were like, you know, like 4000 is what we want to spend a month. That's what we're looking to spend. Um, and interest rates were lower then, of course. Mm -hmm. But like for the average person looking right now, I'm sure they're thinking to themselves like, if I'm looking for like something for $4,000 a month, are there going to be additional fees that I got to come up with? Or is that $4,000 or whatever my budget is, is that including like HOAs, home insurance and everything too? And is there some gotchas that I'm not thinking about right now? Well, that, that's a great question. And there's definitely like some gotchas. And that's why it's important that when it comes to a mortgage, when you're talking about monthly payment, really what you should be talking about is, of course, the actual loan payment, <clears throat> the mortgage, the, the principal and interest payment. Um, but then you got property taxes. You got to pay Uncle Sam or, you know, at least your state's Uncle Sam. You, you know, sometimes you got to pay the county, sometimes the city. Sometimes there's things called mellow ruse. You and I talk about mellow ruse a lot. That's a sneaky tax that basically is for new developments or newer developments that offset the development, whether it's parks, schools, whatever. That gets passed on to the, to the buyer. And then if the buyer's reselling that property down the road, it potentially gets passed on to that guy. Um, you've got homeowner's insurance. You know, you've got flood insurance potentially. Depending on where you're, you're watching this from, you may have hurricane insurance or mud insurance, but primarily for our audience, it's dealing with your flood and sometimes earthquake insurance, depending on, you know, how close to the fault you, uh, you know, you want to live. But when you add all of those things together, oh, I almost forgot one, homeowners association dues. Of course. You know, if you're buying a condo or you're in a master plan community, stuff like that, gated community, you're going to have HOA dues. That's your total monthly payment. That is like when you go back to establishing a budget and you're like, hey, the wife and I, we've, we've decided that we can afford 4,000 bucks a month. That four grand is your all in payment. That doesn't include, of course, like your AT&T or your Xfinity internet or SMUD or your utilities or whatever, or repairs and maintenance on the home. That's, that's a whole different, you know, ball of wax. But in terms of your monthly payment, those are things that no matter what happens, you're going to have to pay the taxes. You're going to have to pay the insurance. You're going to have to make the payment. So you got to plan on, on uh, being able to afford those. Okay. So, okay. Like, let's say right now you're sitting yourself and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to buy this like $700,000 house mm -hmm. and I got a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Um, as far as like 
as far as a client or someone who calls up and says, look, I got $200,000. I'm thinking about buying a $700,000 house. Like what would be your recommendation as far as um, how much of that to use as a down payment, how much to kind of keep in the bank? Like a lot mm -hmm. of people are saying, you know, like don't go 20%, even though it's PMI, keep a lot of money. Cash is king right now. Like sure. what, what is your opinion on that? Well, uh, you know, my opinion, funny is over time, my opinions changed on that. Like if, if I would go back in time years ago, my opinion was much more in alignment with like Dave Ramsey, don't have any debt, pay it all off, you know, pay cash if you can. Um, and, and although that sounds cool, um, the, it's, it's a little bit short sighted because you're basically, if you had 200 grand or 300 grand, uh, you know, most likely, unless, you know, you're not being active with your money, most likely, that money is actually being invested. It's making more than inflation. It's probably making more than the interest that you would pay on a home loan, basically. And so there is a strong argument that somebody could make where you're better off putting the minimal down, keeping your cash, as you said, cash is king, keeping that money, making money, um, offsetting basically the additional cost of you know borrowing more, basically, um, but it also puts you in control of your cash because once you, once you put the cash into the property, the only way you can get it back out is either sell the house, which that means you need somewhere to live again or refinance. But that means you got to change the terms of your loan and who knows what future interest rates are going to be. So it's hard to plan that into the equation. So, you know, when, when somebody comes to me in the initial stages of buying a house, I, I'll, although I, I have tons of questions, two of my questions are, what's your total budget, which was I was talking about, like, okay. what's the most that you feel comfortable with spending on a monthly basis? Because after I look at your loan application, I may figure out that you can qualify for seven grand a month. That doesn't mean that you want a $7,000 a month mortgage payment. So I'm not going to just send you out the door with a pre-approval for seven grand a month when that's not what you ultimate. I don't want you going and writing offers on houses that ultimately are outside of your budget just because you qualify. So that's kind of one thing is like, what do you want your monthly to be? And then the other question, and these every single buyer that we talk to, we ask these questions. The other one is how much, what's the total amount of money you want to come up with to get the deal done? Like what's your down payment and in, inclusive your closing costs? What's the total amount of money that you've got available to make this happen? And if, if you answer those two questions, and then of course, complete your loan application and provide your income docs and those kinds of things behind the scenes, we can reverse engineer all the math to figure out, all right, Mark, you said that you did not want your mortgage payment to exceed $4,500 per month when we include tax, insurance, HOA, all that stuff. And you also have 250 grand available. So if you want your, if your purchase price to be X amount of dollars, here's how much money you need to come up with in order for your payment not to exceed the 4,500 goal. And basically just filling in the gaps of the various scenarios, giving you as the buyer all the data that you need to make an educated buying decision. Because once you got the, the numbers there, the only thing that can kind of fluctuate is obviously interest rates change. Um, and then maybe concessions between the seller or whatever. But for the most part, you will know, you know, hey, all right, I now know that I need to stick with a purchase price of 650 or whatever the case is in order to be like within my mark or whatever. Um, I do recommend also that, you know, once you do establish all of those things, you've established your budget, your target price, all that stuff. You know, when you go in to write an offer, like when you find the house that, you know, it's now go time, reach back out to your loan officer. Like I, I always tell our clients, call us back up. Let's revisit all the numbers because who knows, maybe 60 days is, have passed or 90 days and, you know, rates have gotten worse. They've gotten better. Maybe you got a little bit less money now to work with or this property that you really like needs more work. So you want to retain more of your money or whatever. But I would definitely continue to revisit the numbers so that all the way across the finish line, you're making an informed, you know, educated decision. You want to feel good about it at the end of the day. Right. So 
Well, I mean, the thing for me is like when I when I was looking to do the purchase, it was like I had a certain amount of money in the bank, and I was looking to get a certain payment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I worked with New Way. So the idea for me was I was calling up, going like, "What if I put this much down? Yeah. What if I did this? What if I did this? What if I?" And I was just going between the loan types and talking about closing costs and everything too. So, don't think that you're kind of locked in as far as what your you know percentage you have to put down is. Sometimes PMI doesn't make the most sense. Um, the loan types definitely like FHA will always kind of get you in as far as like for the, for everything, but as far as like for interest rates and everything too, but sometimes FHA gets flipped to conventional. The idea for you is to kind of keep in mind like what that monthly payment looks like and uh, versus how much you're going to be able to actually keep in the bank. Um, because like for me, it was one of those things that I said, look, I want to buy this house. I'm good with that much of a down payment. I'm good with this per price per month. But one of the things that really kept me feeling secure was the idea that I had enough money in the bank to kind of mm-hmm. like, if everything hit, it just went horribly wrong. Sure. We would at least have like a year, year and a half that we were able to like exist, same lifestyle and everything too. That made me feel a little bit more easy. And I'd say like, you know, at times numbers can get a little overwhelming. At times you just get overwhelmed. Life can do that to you. But the idea is you have to think about like, what does that look like as far as job security, as far as everything? Mm-hmm. And as far as how much you feel comfortable, what you have in the bank, like what does that look like? Don't look at anyone else. Look at yourself. What's that? What's going to give you that good night's sleep? Totally. What amount in the bank is going to do that for you? Because let's be honest right now, the economy is just like, you know, here and there, presidential election, everything too that's going on. But, but the idea for us is to always like feel feel like you're not sweating it at 2 a.m. waiting for a refi or like, you know, you put too much down and then you're thinking to yourself, man, you know, I thought my job was a little bit more stable than it is. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like a month, you know, a year and a half to basically kept it that in the bank. My payments were pretty much what I wanted them to be. Um, And I was picky about my first time home. I didn't just buy anything. I didn't want to do that. A lot of people, you know, feel like, you know, because there's such pressure in the market right now, it's like, you know, you got to get something. There's no Mm -hmm. inventory. Interest rates are going down. They're going up. You got to jump in. Um, I didn't buy into that. I kind of like, you know, I probably lost a little bit. I got a little higher interest rate because I didn't, I, because I didn't jump in, but I don't kick myself for that. I say to myself, like I was very educated. I went out there. I looked at a bunch of houses and the one I chose, I decided on, even though I might've paid a higher interest rate, I feel better about my decision. I don't feel like rushing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to get out of that mentality and that whole idea of the, of the market. You got to keep, go get away from the Joneses, right? You know, sure. you have to kind of figure out what your timetable looks like and you want to make that educated decision. Sure. You don't to wait like three years and miss out on 2.75s but there is that middle ground you know what i mean for a first-time home buyer well you gotta you know we say this all the time you gotta time your life not the market and you know it's i get questions all the time from people like is now the right time to buy a house is this the right type of loan program for me is this a good interest rate is this is this is this and, and at the end of the day, there is no, like, you know, carte blanche answer for everything because everybody's individual scenario is different. Sometimes an FHA loan is a way better deal for this person than this person. Or sometimes, even though this person qualifies for a loan, it's a terrible idea for them to yep. buy a house right now. And unless you have all the information and, and then have an honest conversation with yourself about, you know, your, or with your wife or partner partner or whatever of, you know, where, where do we actually stand? And is this realistic? Like, you know, one of the things that I I do feel like today is always going to be a better time to buy than tomorrow. If, if I can actually afford to buy today in terms of my, like, I, I feel good about my job. I feel good about my life. Like my timing in my life is good because there's, there's, you know, we've seen with the amount of inventory and, you know, with the lack of builders being able to surpass demand and all that stuff that this supply and demand thing, it's like you sit on the sidelines, you, you do end up paying longer in the long run, but you're better paying, you're better off paying uh, more in the long run and wait because you can't afford to actually do it today. than just to keep up with the Joneses, like you're talking about where yeah. it's like, Hey, everybody's buying a house. 
I got to buy a house, but, you know, my wife, Linda, you know, we just got word that they're laying off half of the company. I don't know if she's going to be a part of it or that, you know, probably be pretty crazy for, you know, me and Linda to go buy a house if that were the case or whatever. Right. My wife's Jamie, though, so don't tell Jamie. (laughs) Well, okay. here's the thing, though, too. Someone um, for my team, Melanie, who's like handles all our investors and everything, too. She's telling me, you know, and it was funny because, um, you know, she's she's like, hey, what what would you tell your daughter as far as buying a home and everything, too? Mm. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, I do think that in society as we have it, we feel like we have to be a certain age or we have to be like, you know, picket fence, that whole thing. And I think that, like, if I could go back in time and do it, I would find some kind of situation where I could rent out rooms. Mm -hmm. And what I told Melanie, without a hesitation, I'm like, I would tell her and I would probably help her do this, buy a duplex, you know, live in one side, rent out the other. And that's what I'd do. I think the idea is as soon as you start kind of getting into the mindset that, you know, try not to pay rent and try to like, you know, maximize every situation you're in, especially when you're like younger, you know, you don't have the kids, you don't have a family, you know, totally. like a million of cars and everything too. You can kind of live a little lighter. Um, like Justin, who we put I into was, that you're one. I was thinking about him the whole yeah. time. He did the smart, he's going to be a millionaire someday. Oh, c- completely. I mean, he, you know, you, uh, he was at Sacramento State and he had just graduated. And so he uh, bought a house in the Rosemont area. I think it's like around 435. He um, moved into the primary suite. He rented out the other three bedrooms and he basically, Basically, just let it let it do its thing, and he's like, "I'm not paying any rent. I got my house, and these guys are, that are my fraternity brothers are paying off my rent." So I think that would be the one thing that I'd say to people: don't have that stigma of like you have to be a certain point in life to actually get a house. There are creative ways that you can do it, and for me at least, like reversing you know the aging process, I would go back and kind of do that. Oh yeah. Um, but okay, let's get back into the first time home buyer. Now, let's say someone is looking right now. And they're saying to themselves, okay, I got some money, but I don't have a lot of money. The market's tough. Like, as far as, like, funds needed to close, what would you say, like, realistically? $500,000 house or putting 10% down, what kind of funds to close would you say? Well, I mean, you need, obviously, the the 10%, which is, you know, 50000 bucks, which that would be more than the, the minimum down. The minimum down is 3%. I would say that the most utilized scenario, unless you are a first time home buyer and you make less than 80% of the area median income, which if you're in the greater Sacramento region, that's roughly 92 grand. So if you make less than 92 grand, um, 3% down is a smoking hot deal. Yeah. Um, because you qualify for both Fannie and Freddie Mac's, uh, uh, home affordable programs where they waive all the fees that they charge for not putting the down payment basically. Um, so you can still get a really great rate and also cheap mortgage insurance, which you'd mentioned earlier about mortgage insurance, PMI, you know, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of negative stigma around PMI and that much more so comes from like a few generations of buyers back. Yep. Um, when PMI was much more of the wild, wild west. Um, now, uh, although there's only six PMI companies in the United States, because of price competition, yeah. it, they basically, they've gotten whittled down to nothing. And so, uh, you know, we have access to the cheapest PMI in the nation. Um, so if, if you've got good credit or decent credit, PMI is cheap. If you've got challenge credit, well, that's where FHA loans are going to most likely come in and maybe be a cheaper solution. But even if that's the case, you only got to do three and a half down. That said, though, we're talking how much cash you got to come up with potentially. So if you were doing 10% down or 5%, obviously it's whatever percentage of your sales price, that's your down payment. As far as closing costs go, okay, which is this is like the big mystery, right? I would say that you should plan on somewhere between two to 3% of the sales price for closing costs. Could it be a little bit less? Absolutely. Could it be a little bit more depending on the loan program that you ultimately select and also the lender? Cause some lenders, they charge a ton of fees. Not yeah. all lenders do. We're a mortgage broker. We don't, you know, go crazy with our fees. Mortgage brokers are known for, for, you know, having low fees. Right. Uh, but if you're working with uh, you know, rocket mortgage or whatever, they're going to charge you a few points. And so a point is 1% of what you're borrowing. So you, you know, if you got a couple points and then you also have title escrow property tax, all the other stuff that maybe adds up to, you know, four or 5% or whatever. But on average, if you plan on being around two to 3% for your closing costs, 
I'd say that you're going to be in the ballpark. Keep in mind that part of your closing costs, there's kind of like three things that really kind of dictate your closing costs. One is the lender that you work with. Um, again, I suggest you work with a, a mortgage broker. You're going to get a better deal. But then the other two pieces to it is your negotiation between you and the seller, which you know, your real estate agent, that's where, you know, they come in and in, in terms of negotiating, you know, I can't even tell you how many times Mark's negotiated on behalf of clients for ours, where like, he's getting them some sort of credit or getting it to where like the seller is going to actually pay that fee or this fee or all the fees or whatever the case is. Again, it's case by case. It's, you yeah. know, every seller's got a different situation. So you can't just carte blanche expect credits with everybody. Right. Um, but there's the negotiation between you and the seller and then also the actual company or companies that are being used for those services the escrow company the title company um, and how much those companies charge for their fees that's going to vary it's going to be a little bit different from you know lennar title to old republic title or whatever but when the dust settles as long as you're not working with a lender that's just going crazy with the fees, you should be around that like two to three percent range of your sales price plus whatever the percentage is of your down payment. Now, it's worth pointing out, guys, that you can get credits for closing costs from the seller. But that's again, that's where you need a really strong real estate agent negotiating on your behalf to ask for those credits, but depending on what type of loan you're doing and your down payment percentage, you know, you can get anywhere between like three to up to 9% uh, in seller credits. I would say that expecting credits on the high end is probably very unrealistic in this competitive market, but getting something like a one or two percent credit or something especially if you guys are massaging the sales price a little bit and everything you know mark's not in his head he knows how to make the oh, deal yeah. happen he's all right. he already knows how he's going to structure that one. Oh yeah one month on the market one percent <laughs> two months on the market two percent but okay okay so okay so we hit kind of like you know funds near the close let's talk about and this is probably a little bit more my arena as far as like the little things, right? And they're not little because, I mean, they are cost. They're things you also got to factor in as far as, like, inspections. Mm -hmm. Total inspections, you're probably running around maybe about 1200 1500 maybe. Maybe less than that, depending on how big the property is as well, too. You know, doing the roof, doing the house, doing the pest. Um, and then maybe doing the sewer or septic if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's stuff like the appraisal. What do you mean, 500 700 right Five there? to 700 bucks. It, it, you know, the if you're, like, buying a million or more dollar home, you're going to pay more, like, seven 800 bucks for an appraisal if you're you know in the average price range around five six hundred bucks for an appraisal that is by the way as far as the lender is concerned typically not all lenders are the same but most lenders that's going to be your only upfront out-of-pocket expense beyond maybe the cost of a credit report um, but beyond that all of your lender fees um, along with like title, escrow, yeah. all that other stuff that's due at the end of the transaction, like maybe three to four weeks from whenever you guys say yes, basically. But all the other inspections that, that Mark's talking about, those are often, by the way, guys, the inspections you don't want to tell your lender about. They don't, you know, the lender doesn't need a copy of all those reports unless they specifically ask for one, cause that'll open up a can of worms. But all of those inspections, those are out of pocket expenses because you got to pay each inspector like at the time of the inspection, yep. right? Yeah. So those, I mean, those are like the out of pocket things. The other things too, you have to need to factor in as well too, is like moving costs mm -hmm. as far as cleaning. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes as much as it stinks, sometimes the seller doesn't leave the house in great condition. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is you probably want to bring in a contractor to look at all those things on the home report because more than not, you're going to probably not get those things fixed, but you'll get like a dollar amount. And normally you want the contractor to jump into the house and fix some of that stuff, especially if it's health, health and safety or whatnot. Um, and then this stuff that you want to do that, like, like for me, when I closed on my house, I was like, I want the carpets gone. I want this. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be some, you know, some, you know, some money that you're going to need to like jump into right away. Mortgage payment starts like the following month. So you don't have to pay it right away, which is good. Um, and then stuff like, you know, starting up your sewer or starting up your, your, um, water and all yep. that stuff too. Transferring all the utilities. Yeah. And then, you know, like probably buying additional furniture. If you did a little bit of an upgrade to a larger house, lawn furniture, the whole nine yards. By the way, guys, on, on the furniture or buying other things, 
wait until your transaction is closed. Yeah. Because if you're at the Home Depot and, you know, you're looking at all the new appliances and they got a special going on, it's, you know, the the St. Patrick's Day special, but your loan, your transaction doesn't close until after St. Patrick's Day, you're better off just waiting without the special because when they pull your credit, not only is that going to potentially hurt your credit score, which could hurt the loan that you qualify for, but the lender is going to have to, assuming you're getting a loan, guys, the lender is going to have to count that in your debt to income ratio. So all of a sudden, let's say that you were right under the threshold and now all of a sudden we got to add in the washer, dryer, refrigerator combo and that takes you over the threshold and now you don't qualify. That, that sometimes is something where buyers accidentally shoot themselves in the foot with their deal all because they, you know, went shopping a little too soon. I just well, I wanted think, to add that. Well, I think I think the thing is you should always kind of keep tabs with your like your lender oh, and yeah. your realtor. But anything that like is like an added purchase, something, I mean, you, you, there's just you just have to kind of check in. It's not like, you know, an over oversighting what you're doing, but for the most part, like we just want to make sure that major you're purchases. Get, yeah, we're just gonna try to get you to close. So, you know, anything like a major purchase, anything like anything, like, you know, that's part of our gig. That's part of our job. Mm -hmm. And so keeping tabs with us is, is pretty, pretty important as far as all that stuff goes. And like Aaron normally, will, like when she, when he talks to someone on the phone, talks to him a little bit about the situation, he'll make that perf perfectly apparent as well too. Um, and for, as far as us go, as far as the realtor goes, those are kind of the fees. I mean, you know, like um, the, what's called the inspections are done, the, the person who's buying the buyer pays for it because those people actually work for you. Now, let's say, for example, we're working together and I say, hey, you should use Bob's pest, pest thing. I'll never say that. I'll say, hey, this is a suggestion. But if you have your own person, if you have your own home inspector, use them. They work for you directly. And if you have a good relationship and it's someone that really you trust, you've worked with before, bring them definitely into the transaction. The idea is that um, the home report is going to be a little, like, a little ominous, but at the same time, you know, a good home inspector should be able to translate that stuff to the buyer well as far as telling them how much this is going to cost and everything, too. So those are, I mean, those are probably the added things that I'm thinking. The big ones that caught me by surprise probably were, like, supplemental. Mm-hmm. Tax bill. Let's let's explain the okay. supplemental tax yeah, bill. Yeah, this is a big one, guys. So so this is a primarily California only thing, but this does happen in some other states as well. But the way that it works is when you buy a house in California, when you are paying the property tax bill at the time of sale, you are paying a prorated base off of the current owner's tax basis, not your tax basis that you're now creating with your sale. So if if the seller, for instance, bought the place for $200,000 in 1990, and they're now selling it for a million dollars, um, well, there's a $800,000 difference in, in tax basis. And so the fees that are being collected are off. And so what will happen is, is depending on what county you're in and what time of the year you're completing your transaction, within roughly 90 to 120 days-ish of closing your transaction, you're gonna get this bill in the mail from the county tax assessor. And most loan officers do a dismal job of explaining this to buyers. It's always a surprise. It drives, this is one of the things where, when I was in management, drove me nuts because, you know, a lot of loan officers forget to tell people about this. We kind of shove it down people's throats because we don't want those phone calls because it can be a pretty expensive bill depending on that disparity between where the seller got it and you got it. And that bill, depending on what time of the year your deal happened is due either once or twice. So that's a surprise. That's kind of a gotcha on, uh, you know, although it's everybody's got to pay it. It's one of those things where a lot of people don't know about it. They already acquired the property. The deal's done. Yeah. And then like three or four months later, this surprise bill shows up. Talk a little bit about home warranties, because I know that, you know, that's another thing that is a potential um, cost that you as a buyer have to decide on if you want to take on. And there's a lot of argument you know, uh, of like, well, is it a waste of money? Is it not a waste of money? You've gotten to see, you know, because a lot of people's opinions anecdotal based off their own personal experience. Whereas like you've seen dozens and dozens, hundreds of people go through the process and you hear a lot of feedback. I mean, is a home warranty worth it in your eyes? 
Uh, especially if the seller pays for it. Normally what we'll do with our clients is have like the seller pay for it. Mm. And we don't really get a lot of pushback on that. Usually it's like 500 for like a, a little a home and then yeah. maybe like 750 if you include the pool. I think it's worth it. I think that honestly, like the first year is just nerve wracking. A lot of times, especially if you're a first time home buyer, it's like nerve wracking. And the idea that, that everything like stove, you know, like HVAC, like everything too, like will be in, in you know, protected for at least a mm-hmm. year. And then if you want to, I think it's an additional $200 to get it additionally, but that's on you. I, I like that myself. Like I definitely included it on mine. Everyone that I do, I do that just because you don't know the wear and tear on some of these items. I mean, a lot of times like, you know, like the sellers like crossing their fingers and going like, you know, hopefully that HVAC still kicks in and Mm -hmm. it's above level. So I like that idea of having that included in the deal. I think there's a little peace of mind to it. Um, A lot of times when we've done transactions for our buyers and the seller hasn't been willing to actually do it, we've actually kicked in and basically said, we'll take care of it for a year for you guys. Um, And you know, that's just a peace of mind thing. And that's one of those things that, you know, yes, inspectors go in there. Yes, they go through everything too. But now and again, you know, it's just like a car. You never know when it's going to break down. And so the last thing you want to do is get someone a house. The house looks all pretty and Mm -hmm. it's spotless. It's clean. It looks fantastic. And then we're in Sacramento, 110 degree weather and the AC breaks down and then they're calling you and going like, Hey, can you tell me about your warranty? And you're like, Oh, we didn't get you one. I mean, and then you really spotlight is on you. And so Mm -hmm. for us, we try to like make sure that, that that's definitely part of the deal. Um, going forward after the year, it's up to you. Um, for me, um, I keep it on just, just for the sake of sanity. Um, and also it depends on who you go with. Some uh, Fidelity is really good. There's other people that aren't really good. You just got to kind of figure out their policy on replacements, on HVAC replacements, or are they going to just you know, nickel and dime you yeah. for like $75 every visit. And you just got to know this. This is kind of why working with like a good agent really kind of works. Um, but the main thing for us when we're working with first time home buyers is we want to give that peace of mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like our thing is always like the first time home buyer is like, that's our first date. You know what I mean? Like we totally. want to do right. Everything's good and solid because going forward, we want them to realize that we got their back in the situation. We got their back in the transaction and that like, you know, we, we got them what they need. Landscapers, we got you. Contractors, we need, we got you. HVAC person at like midnight, they can go out there uh-huh. and do it. We got you. And it's a big thing because your first time home buyer, that's their entrance into the market. Who knows where they're going to go? And we want to be there with every step of the way. So I, I like us. that you're, you know, building the home warranty into the process almost like automatically, if you will. Yeah. You know, if it, you know, we're, we've been talking about, you know, un, you know, thought about expenses, surprises, basically. And, you know, even even experienced home buyers, I think that, you know, because it's not like people are buying houses every single day. This sure. is like a, you know, once, two, three, four times in a lifetime transaction, right? So how how good can you really be if you only practice that much, right? So if if I'm trying as a first time home buyer that, that, you know, I have no idea, one of the biggest mistakes I think in budgeting is people don't really give thought or at least like realistic thought to what is the home actually going to cost to maintain and repair and all that stuff into the future. And part of it, you have no idea. Like I can't tell you that, Oh, well that house right there is going to cost you. I I don't know what's going to happen to that house over the next year, five years or whatever. I don't know how meticulously, you know, you maintain it. I don't know about the previous owner, all of the weather, all those things. So it kind of takes, I've got a pretty good idea of like operating my house now, but I've also owned it for like 12 years, right? So like the cool thing with the home warranty is I almost feel like it shields me a little bit from Murphy's Law. And like, you know, I'm not just moving in and then the hot water heater goes out and that costs double, you know, to replace than what the home warranty would have cost. Well, that's the thing too. You have to like, I mean, there are little things, right? Like the fences, right? The fence being like because of this wind being blown down, that's like $10,000. There's like things like, you know, you uh, have a little dry rot on your siding and maybe you need to get that fixed, you know, because of the winds and the weather that we have here in Sacramento. Now, again, you have to kind of like, just understand that there is maintenance. It's just part of the, part of the gig, mm-hmm. you know, like maybe even, I mean, as little as like maybe your sprinklers in your backyard start misfiring, you don't know how to work them or like your hot tub or is like the gas, you know, doesn't work for it or whatever. I know champagne problems, but there are just these little things that like they're every little, Data, data things that aren't covered by the warranty, but things that you have to deal with. Like, you know, 
oh my God, like my garage door, it doesn't work, it broke, I got to fix it. You know, well, that might be covered under a home warranty, but there are these little things that are just homeowner mm-hmm. things that you got to deal with. Like, you know, sometimes you got a backed up toilet and you're like, whoa, what do I, what do, I do there? It's like, well, okay, I got to call someone to take out the yeah. sewer line. And, you know, and as you kind of get used to this stuff, it is going to cost you money to kind of figure this stuff out. But then you get like after about a two year span of doing the house and you kind of expect these things. And you kind of like, you, you get a hold of it a little bit and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. you're like, I replaced that fence there, this fence over here, I can see it. We got about five years left in this. Yep. And then you start to kind of get a hold of it and you start to kind of schedule your maintenance, your repairs and everything too. And, and that way you can also kind of say, okay, look, this year we'll do this, this, like for us, for example, like we want to redo our backyard, but we didn't do the whole thing. We did our like pool area first. And then this, ba- this summer we saved money to do one side of the backyard. And then we're going to do the other side of the backyard as well, or the side yard as well too. So as soon as you kind of get a hold of everything that kind of needs to be done, then you can start having the fun of like putting money towards the things that you want to get done. Mm-hmm. And all the stuff that you want to get done if you're really, really like strategic, will go towards actually like adding value to your house. Sure. And then at the end of the day, you'll say, hey, I bought my house for $700,000. I put in this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Wow. Like five years later, it's like 780. This is awesome. And you know, this, and that's kind of home ownership. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does cost money. As far as Aaron and I went over it, as far as like what you're going to need to, you know, funds to close, closing costs, your budgeting, all that kind of repairs and everything too. But at the end of the day, once you kind of get a hold of the idea that you do have this payment, yet that you do have maintenance costs, that you have, you do have this, it just kind of, you settle down in it and you're like, this is just, part of the game and you get used to it, I guess you can call it. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but, you know, you, you think about it, everybody's in a game. The, the The opposite of the game is that I just have my lease payment, but I don't get to choose, you know, what I do in that house necessarily or how I, you know, paint the walls or if I want to remodel or do this in the backyard. Or even if the landlord's like, yeah, go ahead and knock yourself out. Um, I, I remember like in my younger days when I was renting, I had a landlord, I can't even remember specifically what I wanted to do, but I remember him being like, yeah, go for it. And then as I'm like w- walking through the process, it was something in the backyard. Um, I was thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to go spend my money to improve. I think it was like the little, uh, patio, uh, yeah. you know, things. And, uh, I'm like, I'm going to spend my money on that guy's pro- That doesn't make any sense. And I ended up, you know, that was a stupid idea. Sorry. I even suggested it. Whereas when it's my house, you almost have like a, you and not only do you really enjoy it, but then you have that like pride of ownership feeling afterwards because it's yours. You made it the way that you want it. And it's a storage of value, right? Like, you know, your house is, you know, on average 5.37% a year, your home's value goes up. And so, you know, you, you've got this thing building wealth for you that you're also getting to enjoy and you need a place to live. So it's... For me, it was never about that whole idea of like the building wealth thing or the appreciation. Mm. That stuff I never counted on. For me, it was more along lines of like, I wanted a place for like my daughter to swim during the summer times. I wanted a place where we can bring in family. My mother's getting older, so she can come in here too. Mm -hmm. I wanted a place that, yeah, we could do our upgrades. And and if we did anything to the house, you know, it wouldn't be something that we'd have to check with a landlord. So for me, I mean, and I get everyone's always like about that whole like, oh, it's about wealth. You're going to appreciate like... I don't really factor that too much in. I say to myself, like, look, I love the house. I love the area. Um, I'm excited that, you know, my family gets to have that experience with Mm -hmm. me. And for me, it's more about the journey as opposed to like that idea of like, oh yes, I get to sell it for a hundred thousand dollars, like in four years. Like, yeah, if it happens, it happens. But at the same time, I look at it like I'm not paying rent and I jumped into home ownership and I just never looked back and I love it. You know, that's, Mm -hmm. that, that's for me straight up. Sure. No, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, if you're not actually like talking about real estate investing and you're talking about the house that you're going to live in, the wealth is like, that's like the ancillary benefit that it is a huge benefit, especially over time. I mean, holy cow, the amount of quote unquote, you know, money that gets created over time. But ultimately it's, you got to have a place to live. So I like that, you know, you're able to basically control your rent you, you know, lock in your mortgage payment, you've picked, you know, your, your place, put a flag in the ground and, uh, you know, the improvements or changes that you make, you know, it's yours basically. So, yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's kind of it, you know, like, um, 
Uh, and, you know, I, I wish home ownerships on, and if ever, on everybody. I think it's like one of those things that you get a pride feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, it's not really for me like the whole idea of like, I, n I never jumped in it for the, oh my God, the appreciation. I, sure. You know, I did it more for like, I wanted to basically have something that was my own. Mm -hmm. Um and just to have those family gatherings and just just have something that I'm smiling about that I, and like the idea of rent has always kind of like hit me is like uh e and even though I mean a lot of people are going to say oh yeah I mean back maybe in the 2.75 days like mortgages are cheaper mortgages in Sacramento are more expensive than rents mm -hmm. they just are I mean sure. there's just there's no way getting around it but at the same time Rent is kind of money being thrown away to a landlord, whereas like, you know, your mortgage payment, there is some satisfaction in knowing you're kind of paying, you know, your bank, but you're paying off something that eventually one day will be yours. So I, I like it. And like I said, hopefully we, we were able to kind of give you guys a little bit about the first time home buyer and things you can like, you know, the road to it, things that you might have to kind of count on for costs and everything too. I mean, is there any additional costs you can think of? You know, no, not 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 until after you already own the property. Then it's you know the sky's the limits, I guess, right? <laughs> right you can have some fun, build out those barbecue pits. Yeah, build, outdoor kitchen. Bring out a spa from Costco. I mean, so many fun things you can do. Um, but at the same time, like I said, just make sure that if you are going to buy a house, that the timing is right for you. Don't get so caught up into this hoopla of like, you know, this keeping up with the Joneses. Make mm -hmm. sure the timing is right for you. Yep. Um, and you'll know, you'll know job security, funds in the bank and everything too. And then work with someone like an Aaron, a great lender who can basically, you know, a broker who can basically tell you that like, hey, look, this is kind of my strategy, what I would probably do. Let, mm -hmm. him, let him lay out some programs for you to break it down for you and say, this is why this this is better. This is why this is worse. You know, this is what your mortgage payment looks like if you're putting this much down and everything too. And then of course, reach out to our team so we can show you some amazing properties in Sacramento um, and work with us every step of the way from your first home to your forever home. Or maybe that first home is the forever home. And, and that's mm -hmm. it though. That's my first ho time home buyer guide. Don't be scared. We got your back video. Anything well, hold else? on. You got to tell them about your app that does not stalk them 24 seven stealing their their information oh guys we got a great app right now hey guys this is mark okay our development team created a app for you it's called the sacramento real estate app and you're able to find it in the app store just type in sacramento real estate it is an app that gives you basically exact functionality of apps like zillow realtor.com and guess what guys we do not share your information with a billion other realtors or whatnot in fact if you download the app and one of our team contacts you and you say i don't want to be contacted i'm not ready to just text us back and you will never hear from us again until you're ready to buy downloadable at the app store all you have to do is type in sacramento real estate and like i said it's a pretty amazing app i mean it's everything that you'd want everything you just search zip codes all that kind of fun stuff you got the card view you got the grid view you can favorite you can find out open houses it's pretty awesome and the best thing about it guys is that it gives you that complete non-fear that someone's going to call you every single day for the rest of your life until you find a house and then probably then some downloadable at the app store the sacramento real estate app okay guys i'll enjoy this video this is how we plan on doing the monday videos unless of course you wanted the lives back and then we're good to do that as well too um this is for all you first time home buyers guys uh it can be a little daunting in the sacramento area aaron's here of course available help his contact information below mine also if you want to talk a little bit about it we do good real estate therapy um as far as home, first home buyer are there any parting words you can give people i would just say guys there is no such thing as a bad question there are so many questions when you're trying to figure out does this make sense for buying a house? Please ask your questions. Either put them in the comments below, reach out to us directly, but that's what we like doing is answering those questions. Like, comment, subscribe. Until next video, we're out of here.